محمد حبنا صلی اللہ رسول کریم اما بعد فاؤز باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب شرخ صدری و سرلی عمری واحد العقدت عمل لسانی یفقہ قولی Oh my Lord, open for me my chest, grant me self-confidence, contentment and boldness, and ease my task for me, and lose the knot from my tongue that they may understand my speech. Rabbi Zibni Ilma, oh my Lord, increase me in knowledge. Allahumma fatihni fi deen, oh Allah, grant me the understanding of deen. <coughs> Assalamu alaikum, dear sisters. Alhamdulillah, hope you are all well. Um, today, we will, oh, we, you know, last two weeks we've been doing... Um, Surat Al-Kaf and Surat Al-Kaf is mashallah one of the surahs which has four stories in it, stories of trials that the um, the people of the time suffered or endured or showed us how to um, um, uh, how to go through them and we too have those trials this day as well. We may sometimes we recognize the trials and sometimes we don't recognize the trials and it's um i just thought since we've had the we've completed the surah but today instead of doing a, a a recap and the recap would have been quite long in details i just thought we'd do um lessons from it which are going to be very interesting um it was one of the uh most um eye-opening surahs it was a surah that taught us a lot all of us and the lessons from um surat al-kaf is um, first and foremost, we, we learned that Surat Al-Kaf is a source of light for the person who actually recites the Surah. And it is also um, safety from the Dajjal, when the Dajjal, uh, the fitna of uh, the Dajjal. So the fitna of Dajjal is a massive fitna. So if it is a safety um, uh, net from the fitna of the Dajjal, so you can imagine how how much uh, how much safety and security we can receive from this um, from this surah. Now um, the reason the surah was revealed is um, there were men from the ancient times, and what had happened is um, some of the people from uh, the Quraysh they had uh, gone to meet the rabbis and the priest of uh, um, uh, of previous times and they said to them that we've got this person a new person he seems to think he's a prophet um tell us about something that we can ask him so we will know for sure whether he is or isn't or we will sort of like have a, have a better idea so the priests and rabbis they told them that um go back and ask him these three things so they said ask him about the story of the young people and these are the young people that we will discuss. Uh, theirs is a strange and wondrous tale. Ask him about a man who reached um, the ends of the earth, the east and the west. And then ask him about the Ruh. So if he can answer you these questions, then he's, he's a prophet. But if he can't, then he is a man just like you and me. And therefore, you can do with him as you please. So they... Um, came back and they told their people, they said, this is what we've, um, uh, th this is our findings. Um, let's, uh, you know, let's try it. So um, they asked the Prophet Wasallam, and the Prophet said, I will tell you tomorrow. So it was just not like, I will tell you tomorrow. But the Prophet did not say, inshallah. And we must remember that every time we are determined to do something for the future in tomorrow or the day after, we should always say if the will of Allah is there. So Allah is the knower of the unseen and Allah alone knows what was and what is and what is to happen and what is not to happen. So if you say inshallah, then that is uh, putting things in the court of Allah. So a couple of days went past, no, um, uh, no revelation, few more days, few more days, and the Prophet became very, very sad. And the, then Jibreel came and that's when they, they explained that, you know, or whenever you are uh, intending to do something, then say inshallah and the surah was actually revealed as well. So the surah was revealed. So we'll, um, we, we've done the, uh, the soul in the last um, uh, surah, uh, last couple of lessons that we did, that the soul is the matter of our Lord. And nobody knows apart from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about how, you know, where this, uh, what happens with the soul. soul. We have very limited knowledge. All we know is, that, know is that it comes with the command of Allah and it leaves with the command of Allah. Um, 
it is said that if um, it's said with the words of inshallah in Sahih uh, Bukhari it is reported that Abu Huraira said Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam this is a story that it narrates with the words inshallah because we are speaking about the words inshallah there's a, uh, a couple of hadiths that are quite nice to mention that the Messenger of Allah um, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that Sulaiman ibn Dawood which is the prophet that we have just um, spoken about in the past in our sessions uh, Islam said tonight I will go around to all my 70 wives and according to another narration it said 90 or 100 so that each one of them will give birth to a son who will fight for the sake of Allah it was said to him according to one narration an angel said to him say inshallah say if Allah wills but he did not say that and he went around to all the women but none of them gave birth except one who gave birth to a half-formed child. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, By the one in whose hands is my soul, had he said, if Allah wills, he would have not broken his oath and that would have helped him to attain what he wanted. So if one is intending to do something, looking forward to doing something, then one should always say, inshallah, if Allah wills, because nothing will happen unless Allah wills it to happen. And if you forget to say inshallah, then say it when you remember, whenever that is, whether you've said it, uh, whether you remember once you walk out the door, whether you remember the week later or something, just say it as soon as you remember. Now, the stories that we um, covered last week, they were absolutely amazing and we sort of like just couldn't get enough of them and there was just not enough detail that we had, um, we, we, we did because we, um, we did a brief overview of the stories so we didn't do a, a very deep understanding of it but alhamdulillah we still got quite a lot out of it we um we learned quite a lot and it is a surah that we uh, recite every friday and now we know alhamdulillah what the what is actually inside the surah how will we recite it what does it actually say the first story that the um surah mentions is the story about faith so the story about the young people who took refuge in a cave and these were young people um, who came from a culture of uh, worshipping idols they were young people who were very well off they were um, uh, uh, they they lived very affluent lives they had family they uh, they were sons of kings and ambassadors and leaders and so on and they had a very affluent life and you can imagine if you've had a very affluent life and then you have to seek refuge in a cave you it's definitely something that you you have a very strong belief in they um uh, uh, their community or their people would have um a function once a year um a festival so so to speak and during that festival they would um worship idols and they would sacrifice to the idols and they would do lots of things that were very un-islamic so these young people they they went with their society they went with their community and they saw what they were doing and they really didn't think that that's that is what should be happening so they came from a culture a culture of worshiping idols and even though they were young they were more likely to be conscious of their self-image and what people would think about them they chose Allah over everything. They did not follow people blindly. And that's what we usually do. We follow people blindly. We think they know better. They've been doing it for years and years and years. Our grandparents have been doing it. So-and-so has been doing it. So what's wrong? And that is the test for us as well. It was a test for them, but the test for us is far more severe. We live in society where many things are norms, in cultures where many things are, are, you know, are considered to be normal. And they might be considered to be normal, but they're not necessarily right. And this is where we need to put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and follow and, you know, follow the deen of Islam, the deen that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam brought, the sunnah, the Quran, and not follow practices blindly. And these people, they were young and, you know, they obviously used their mind. They thought, right, okay, we're not going to follow this we're gonna ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us so they uh, you know the town that they were living with uh, in was uh, there were disbelievers in there so they decided to migrate from there so they decided to run away for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
And we often think, well, where are we going to go? What are we going to do? Might as well join in with um, you know, all the fun and frolic. And they, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewarded them with mercy. And in the cave, they, they were protected from the sun. And when they woke up 309 years later, they found that the whole, were, um, the whole village were believers. So they had gone to sleep, afraid, frightened, scared because they had run away. There was only a handful of them. They had a dog with them. They were hiding in a cave and you can see, you know, you can imagine how secure or unsecure caves can be. They, they, they must have been petrified. But when they woke up, they, they found that the, the people around them, the entire village were, must, uh, were believers. So with the youth, we must remember that how do we treat the youth? You know, do we encourage them to pray? Do we encourage them to seek the truth? Or I often find in our community, in the Pakistani community, we say to them, you know, party until you're older and then you can do all the other things. You, then you can wear the hijab, then you can have uh, grow your beard, then you can um, start praying. Even something as important as prayer, as salah, we um, tell our children that they can do it later. They can do it when they're much older. Now, with um, the one that follows the right path, whether they're young or whether they're old, but because we're speaking about the youth here, since they're young, if, if you follow the right path during your young days, then certainly you are a winner in this life and in the hereafter. And don't forget the hereafter, we seem to think it's far, far away, but all it is is a click away because you just don't know when you will pass, pass away. We might think we're going to be here forever. We think we're young. We think, you know, we're, we've got everything going for us. But all it is is for this breath to stop coming, this sense to, to stop. And that's it, your soul to leave, and that's the hereafter is in front of your eyes. The Prophet said that uh, young people who grow up obeying Allah and following his orders would be amongst the seven categories of people who would be provided shade on the day of judgment. So, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your youth is a win win situation. Not only do you save yourself. In this world from all sort of uh, atrocities uh, is sort of um, where things where things go wrong or you become a, a target to something or you live to regret what you've done in your youth if you have lived your youth worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then you have peace of mind you have contentment you have you, you have Allah on your side you have blessings in your life and you live a very fruitful life and then when you uh, leave this dunya and you enter the hereafter you will have a very fruitful life uh, um, again in the hereafter and that life is eternal don't forget that life is not going to end and that's the um, the uh, the benefits uh, for the youth now the other people in that category where the prophet ﷺ said that the the youth were um, amongst the people who will be provided shade where there will be no shade except the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one whose heart is attached to the masjid two people who love each other for the sake of allah and this is something that we are now not we, we don't love anybody for the sake of allah we don't visit anybody for the sake of allah we only uh, do things because there's a need there's a need to visit somebody there's a need to um, associate with somebody there's a need to socialize with somebody for some reason but just seeing somebody for the sake of Allah, to see if they're okay, then that, that, those two people, it doesn't say they did anything else, it just says those two people, they will be um, uh, under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day when there is no shade. A man who is invited to sin but declines and says, I fear Allah. And this is a man who is invited to sin by a woman. And we know that men... Uh, you know, women are men, uh, the weakness for men. And if they're invited to sin, it's, it's more or less very unlikely that the man will decline. And in this case, it says that if he does, if he does, you know, sort of like he's invited and he says, I fear Allah, not the fact that he never got the opportunity, there was, it, was never, um, uh, it was never there. It's the fact that he did get the opportunity, but he declined. So he will be one of the people that will be under the shade. 
and the one who spends in charity so secretly that the, the right hand doesn't know what the left hand has given or the left hand doesn't know what the right hand has given. And the one who remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in solitude and his eyes overflow with tears. So these were the categories of people that the Prophet wasallam said would be under the shade. But the reason that we are mentioning this um, hadith is because of the youth, that how important it is for the youth to be um, uh, be associated with their deen, be uh, active with their deen, be um, inclined to learn of, of uh, their deen. And the Prophet wasallam paid particular attention, took a huge interest in the young and highlighted the importance of youth. We tend to ignore the youth, we tend to think they don't know, we don't ask them their opinions, we don't ask them their views, but they are an important part of society. And if we start asking them things, if we start taking their opinions into consideration, then they are more inclined to be involved with us as well. And we, generally speaking, we just think that they, they don't know any better. In one um, hadith, it is uh, the Prophet said, that take advantage of five matters before the other five um, matters kick in, basically. And the uh, those five matters were that your youth before you become old. So again, the youth is mentioned here because there is so much you can do while you are young and you can't do those things when you are older. And your health before you fall sick, your richness before you become poor, and your free time before you become busy and your life before your death and if you look at all of those categories um, your uh, youth before your uh, old age and your health before you fall sick generally speaking you're more likely to fall sick when you are older so your health is when you are your youth when you are young so you are going to be healthy you are going to be um, uh, able you are going to be energetic you have lots of energy and then as time goes on, you, uh, if you uh, fall sick, then you won't be able to do the things that you um, did when you, when you were healthy. Your richness before you become poor and your free time before you become busy. Your free time, generally, you have more free time when you are younger, even though we think, oh, we, you know, they go to college, they go to universities. But still, they don't have the, um, they don't have to run the house, they don't have to uh, pay bills, they don't have to look into things, they don't have to cook, they don't have to clean, they don't have to do all the household chores that an older person would have to do, like a mother would do or a father would do. Any, all the, um, uh, the visiting the relatives, the uh, taking care of everybody's needs, the youth probably do not have to do that. So as you are, you, uh, you are younger, you have more free time. And when you have more free time, you should fill that free time with good deeds. And you will only know what those good deeds are if you look into the Quran. You only, if you look into your deen, you will know what is considered to be good in Islam and what you may consider to be to be good, generally speaking. Because there's lots of things that um, people uh, um, think that they can do. They 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 believe it is good, but it may not be. And your life before your death, and a big chunk of your life is your youth. We seem to think that youth is sort of like, um, speaking from um, uh, the, um, sort, of, sort of like from a British point of view, we think that um, youth is from 11 to 20. Youth, for Islamically speaking, is from 11 or whatever, or whatever age it starts, up until you're 45, 50, because you're still young, you're still energetic, you can still do things. And your life before your death so your life has a big chunk of your youth in there and you need to make sure that you are um, taking care of, of, of that uh, of that um, uh, of, uh, of, of that time in your life they the young people are superior in their capabilities and their energy and that's you know uh, uh, why they are supposed to keep themselves busy with hard work and good work so good work and hard work not just keep themselves busy because you often find people are very busy but they're not really doing anything useful they're not doing anything useful at all they're just um, um they're just uh, uh, they're just wasting their time they're p playing games they're just you know chit chatting and uh, doing things that are they think are useful but they're really not useful 
and that youth um, is considered to be the peak stage in a human life. So because young people have the capacity and the energy to accomplish things, uh, accomplish good deeds that they cannot do when they get older. So there, and also there's stages of life of um, uh, which are mentioned in the Quran. And this is mentioned in Surah Al-Arum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, says, what's translated as, Allah is he who created you in a state of weakness. So your weakness is when you're young and you're frail, uh, you're, um, I was going to say frail, but you become frail when you're, you're old, when you're, when you're young and you're weak and you just cannot look after yourself. And then he gave you strength after weakness. So then you have the full strength and you can do what you want and you think you're the business and you are like, that's it, it's me and I'm here and uh, look everybody, it's me. And then after your strength, he gives you weakness again. And after, with your weakness comes gray hair. So with that weakness at the other end of life, so during your weakness while you're a child, it is a different type of weakness because you know that weakness is going to change into strength. You are going to have strength sooner or later. But the weakness that kicks in after you've had strength, which is old age, you know that after that, there's, you're going to pass away. That weakness isn't going to bring you anything. That weakness is there and it's going to increase and not decrease. So we have to be very, very wise with our youthfulness, basically, even, you know, though we might think that we're older than most of the youth, but even most of us are, are youthful as well. So make time of your, of, of, of your, of your of, make time during your youth. If we don't use our time effectively, if we don't use our time for doing something good, then we will be doing something bad. Which means that if we are doing something bad, then we will be destroying the reward that we that we accumulated or we try and accumulate. So sometimes what will happen is where we accumulate, uh, accumulate reward and then we'll go and do something which is not so good and that reward will decrease or the um, sins will increase and therefore it will, um, it's all like a, counterbalances itself and if you do not praise and mention Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then you will be saying something else so when we speak then and we don't mention um, Allah we don't mention the Prophet sallam, then we're doing other things then what sort of things are we doing perhaps we're backbiting we're talking about children we're talking about work we're talking about our neighbors we're talking about our friends we're talking about our enemies we're talking about lots of things that are things that are in our lives but those things are, you know, they are, if we're talking good, then Alhamdulillah, or if we're giving advice and so on, then Alhamdulillah. But if we're just chit-chatting generally about their situation, their condition, how well they're doing or how badly they're doing, then that, that talking is not going to bring you um, uh, bring you much. So what counts for you is using the time uh, for something useful, doing good deeds and saying good words. So as we spoke last week, that good words are something that we should really be uh, which should be part of our life we should be kind to people we should say nice things to people so hold yourself accountable at the end of each day ask yourself what did i do that was good and what did i do that was bad so it's usually quite obvious but a lot of the time we do need to sort of like try and differentiate which what did what did we do which was good and what did we do which wasn't so good and if it was good then we should increase that and if it was bad, then we should repent from it. We should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to give us the tawfiq to do that again. And we will try and uh, refrain from that. And the um, with regards to the good deeds that you did, be determined to do them again and more frequently. So you're going to do them again and again, but you're going to do them much better. And you're going to do them in a way, sort of like continuously. And... Our lives are judged according to what we did and not according to how many years we lived. So a short life might be very fruitful because you did a lot of good and a long life might be very detrimental because of what you did again. So your life is going to be judged about what you did, not just how many years you've had. And if you've had long, uh, lots of years in this dunya and you did good, then Alhamdulillah, you know, that's fantastic and you earned, uh, uh, earned the paradise. And death awaits us and we do not know when we are going to die. 
So we should make sure that we do as many good deeds as possible before we pass into the next world. Because don't forget, we can only do the, do the deeds in this dunya. We won't be able to do them in the next dunya. So in the next dunya, it's accountability. It's a reward and punishment. It's not, here you go, you've got a bit of time, go and do a tasbih or some, or um, go and do some dhikr. You, you, you have to do whatever you were going to do of good and bad in this dunya. And once you've passed away, you will not be able to return to this life in order to repent from your bad deeds or in order to do more good deeds. Because we think that if we came back to this dunya, then we would do this, we could do the other. Many a, a story in the Quran, it talks about oh, when people will wish that they had come, you know, they could come back. But it will be said, no, you can't. And why do they want to come back? Not to have the same of what they already did. But they want to come back just to do that little bit more good, that that two you know extra units of prayer. They want to do that that little bit extra. And time is very very precious because anything else you can always you know sort of like get that item back, get that thing back. Even if it's money, you can always get get more of it uh, later or another time. But time, when it's gone, it's gone. The three hundred and sixty-five days in the year. Once it's gone, it's gone. You can't. The next 350, uh, 65 days are taking you another 365 years closer to your death. So it's once time is gone, it is gone. So you cannot use it again. And yesterday can never become tomorrow. So any time that has passed will never come back. So your time on this earth, regardless of how old you are now, even though this story was about the youth, but regardless of how old you are, you spending your time wisely in this dunya is what, what, what will count. The second story that we had was the story of the rich friend and the poor friend. It was about um, a man who had two gardens and he was really arrogant and haughty. He was trying to boast in front of his friend and he said, you know, um, he was boasting in front of his friend and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught him a lesson. He would look down on other people and he would reject the truth and his poor friend tried to remind him of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but he was so arrogant and he said to his friend that you know because I have the wealth it just shows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah loves me but then uh, it all came back to, um, to bite him and the reason he was doing that it was a disease arrogance is a disease that no one re recognizes but it is they are crushed with this disease later on in life and it's important that we recognize that we have this disease in our life. And the Prophet Sallallahu said that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, that the only time um, the man finally remembered and wished he was grateful was when it was taken away. So the person that we are speaking about, the person with the garden, once it was taken away, then he realized that I wish I had been grateful. I wish I hadn't said the things that uh, I, I said. And life is not about how much we have or you know how much we don't have. It's about what brings us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So him having all of that did not bring him closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he said to his friend, he said, Oh, I've got so much, you know, look at me. I'm just doing really, really well. And his friend said that if Allah had wanted, he could have given that to me as well. And the same Allah that gave you could give me. So he's, his friend was not impressed by what he was trying to, trying to do and say. And that, um, yeah, and we have um, uh, uh, um, Sheikh Al-Islam Ibn Tamiya um, uh, in one of his books, he says that a calamity which takes you closer to Allah is better than a blessing that takes you away from Allah. So a calamity uh, or something that's happened which you really don't like, it was, uh, it's brought you a lot of grief, but it's taken you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's taught you a lesson in life. It's taught you, it's not all about you. You're not gonna be here forever. Tough times do come, but you need to you know, um, make amends with your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is better for you than a great deal of ease because often during ease, we forget who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. And scholars have argued that ease is probably a more difficult test than calamities. 
as people are prone to forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when they are easy. And that often happens. You'll see people sort of like, you know, when they're uh, living in ease, what they utter from their mouth, sometimes you just sort of like think, what, what sort of things are these people saying? So, yeah, when things are easy, it is all about me, myself and I. I did this, I've done that, I've been here, I've been there. It's just me, 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 my car, my this, my have that, I have this. Look at my suit, look at my car, look at my house. But because um, because we just think it's all what we have done, how we have earned it, how we have spent it. But we don't realize that it's all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like the friend in the story, he, um, because of his wealth, he went to the extent of denying the hereafter. He became delusional and started to think that he actually deserved all the good things. And we all get what Allah gives us. It's what we deserve. If we if we just looked at what we deserve, none of us really deserve anything because what do we do? What do we do that is actually worthy of um, of us getting and uh, getting anything from Allah? It is Allah's mercy that gives us uh, whatever we we have had. So he said that even if there is an afterlife, so this friend that we're speaking about, because I'm doing fantastically here, because I'm doing good here, I'll do good there as well. So he's thinking because he's got money, Allah is pleased with him. That's why Allah's giving him his money. But his friend, his poor friend, because this is the story about the two, two friends, he gave him a tip. He said to him that because what had happened is when he entered his garden, he found that his garden was ruined. But he entered his garden in a very proud manner, in a very arrogant manner. So his friend said to him that when you entered the garden, and you looked at it, why didn't you praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Why didn't you say Alhamdulillah for all these, for your blessings, for your wealth, for your children that he has given to you and not to others? So why did you not say, MashaAllah, la quwwata illa billah? And it's, these are the things that when we are pleased with ourselves, when we are pleased with our children, when we are pleased with our wealth, our home, whatever we are pleased with, then you say these words, MashaAllah, la quwwata illa billah. But if you're if it's you're pleased about somebody else, like you see someone else with these um, with these things, and you're happy for them, then you say Barakallahu uh, fiki. So this is for may, basically meaning may Allah bless you. And if it's uh, a male, it's Allahumma barik lahu. And if it's a female, then it's Allahumma barik laha. So if you admire something for, with somebody else, then you say these words. But if it's something that you admire about yourself like this person with the garden, uh, the garden, then you say, MashaAllah, and we do, we do admire a lot of things about ourselves. We love, you know, how we are, uh, this is really good, my house is really fantastic, my cars, this. So when you admire something about yourself, then those words, MashaAllah, are, uh, are to be uttered. And the the uh, Salaf have explained this and they said that when you are delighted with your circumstances and when you are delighted with your children then let them say mashallah la quwwata illa billah and this person's traits he was arrogant and arrogance is a blameworthy uh, characteristic which who was the first one to be um, arrogant it was Iblis Iblis and his cohorts on this dunya those who um, they, if you are uh, uh, the arrogant ones, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places a seal on their hearts. So the, the first to show uh, arrogance was Iblis, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him to prostrate to Adam and he refused. He, said, he refused, he was arrogant. He said, I am better than him. You created him from fire, uh, uh, you created me from fire and you created him from clay. So he automatically took fire to be better than clay even though nobody had told him that fire was better than clay it, the comparison would never have needed to arise nobody had ever mentioned that but he decided that fire was better than clay and therefore i'm not gonna um, prostrate to him it's narrated from abdullah bin masood that the prophet said no one who has an atom's weight of arrogance in his heart will enter paradise a man said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, what if a man likes his clothes and his shoes to look good? The Prophet um, said, Allah is beautiful and loves beauty. Arrogance means rejecting the truth and looking down on people. Thinking what I'm wearing is 
brilliant, but what you're wearing is cheap and nasty. Thinking that you, what you have is fantastic, but what the other person have, oh, I wouldn't, if they give it to me free, I wouldn't take it. That type of attitude. Just to sort of like, you know, think that what you have is fantastic. And every, uh, everyone who tries to be arrogant and puts himself above others, Allah will bring him down. Allah will bring him down to the lowest of the low and will humiliate him because he is going against reality. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish him by thwarting his aims because the punishment is to fit the crime. And the one who is arrogant towards the people will be trampled beneath the feet of the people on the day of resurrection because of his arrogance. And arrogance is of several types. We often think that arrogance is just once, that's it. You know, people who are a bit uh, high and uh, mighty, who think themselves high and mighty. But with arrogance, one of the types is a person who does not accept the truth and he produces false arguments against it. And we have mentioned the hadith of uh, Abdullah bin Masood that arrogance means rejecting the truth and looking down on people. Then the, uh, the um, arrogance, um, the second type, is when a man admires himself or a person admires themselves. They admire their beauty, they admire them, just sort of like everything is like me, myself and I. They admire their fineness, they admire their food, they admire their clothing, they admire their wealth. And they feel proud and arrogant and they feel superior to other people. It is narrated by um, Abu Huraira that the Prophet ﷺ said, Whilst a man was walking dragging his garments with pride, with his hair nicely combed, Allah caused the earth to swallow him and he will go on sinking in it until the day of resurrection. And this was due to his arrogance. So we need um, to realise that in order to rid ourselves of arrogance, we need to realise that we are just like other people. Everyone is similar. Everyone is born from a mother and a father. The only thing that makes them different in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the taqwa and the fear of Allah. So that's the true criteria. That is what makes you superior or inferior to others. Not, you know, how, well, not, not your arrogance. Um, the arrogant Muslim should realize that no matter what he achieves, he is still too weak to attain the statues the st like the mountains in height or rend nor penetrate the earth. So you might think you, you know, you're um, all healthy and arrogant, but there's nothing you can do. You cannot be like a mountain and you cannot stamp on the earth and make it break. It will just not, it will just not work. And you cannot walk the earth in insolence and become boastful and arrogant. In al qurtubi he um, defines that the phrase not to walk in insolence through the earth is a prohibition of arrogance and enjoining humility. So they, you know, when you walk, you're walking, showing off, and you're sort of like giving the strut, giving it the, the strut. And walking, you know, of course, you know, nobody's saying that you should, you know, walk like an ill person and down and all that, but you should still be modest in your, in, in, in what you do and how you do and how you do uh, and how you do that so often you'll find that arrogant people are hated by the people and they're hated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well Allah does not love the, uh, the arrogant person Allah loves the humble the tolerant and the gentle a uh, gentle person the third story that we um, learned was the story of uh, uh, Moses peace be upon him and that story was the story of knowledge, the test of knowledge. It was about Moses, peace be upon him. He goes to learn knowledge from Al Khidr. Now, Moses is known to be one of the five greatest prophets who had ever lived. And yet, he went to Khidr, who was unknown. There was nobody knew of Khidr. So, we in the Quran only see the mention of Khidr in, in, in this surah. He went to spend time with him and to learn the, from his knowledge. Not only that, but Moses, peace be upon him, tried to abide by the conditions that al khidr had put on him. And when he failed to do so, he ap apologized. And um, al khidr had said to him that do not ask me anything until I tell you myself. So this was another um, thing that because um, uh, Moses would sort of like come in uh, every now and then said, well, why did you do this? 
and then it is soon that uh, that came to an end and uh, Moses peace be upon him teaches us here the value of humility in spite of being a prophet he was willing to humble himself to learn from al Hidr as a teacher so we learn so much from that story and one of the things that we learn is the importance of knowledge and attaching yourself to pious people so Moses peace be upon him was also accompanied by a young man and the young man the Quranic uh, commentators say that that young man that young boy grew up to be a prophet he was called Yusha bin Nun peace be upon him and he attached himself to Moses he was amongst the one that came uh, that became one of the greatest and the Qadr of Allah works in ways that we do not understand so al Khidr taught Moses peace be upon him multiple things on this journey not just one thing not just you know a part of knowledge where multiple things were learned amongst the things that uh, um, uh, al did he was he killed a child that had not done anything and of course this must have caused a great um, uh, a deal of grief for the child's parent but however al knew that allah knew that this child was to be uh, was to grow up he was going to be oppressive he was going to be harsh and his uh, his parents would have suffered at his hands not only would they have suffered at his hands but they would have become disbelievers as well so they would have suffered throughout in this dunya and in the hereafter as well allah knows what we do not know so when things are taken away from you then trust in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala trust allah's divine wisdom um in this case allah's divine wisdom was not clear to a prophet so our cases are even sort of like you know more detrimental we do not know if the prophet um, Moses didn't know but what about people like us let alone people like um, us and now we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always wants good for his person for his people and it is important that we trust the one who has given us everything so Allah gave us life Allah gave us all the things that we have and if Allah takes something away then it is not it, it is not a big deal Allah is going to replace it with something even better so when something is taken away let's just say um, use a very um, uh, a very sort of like a today's problem scenario when we get divorced you know we don't have a partner we don't have an income the income has ceased um, the roof has been taken away from uh, uh, over our head you might think that there's no wisdom in that you know there's a lot of grief there's a lot of pain but there is some sort of wisdom in it we can't think of it at the moment we can't sort of like um, comprehend it at the moment something better will come for us later on as it did for these parents the parents of this little boy when he was taken away and Moses peace be upon him he was actually he did the Rabbi Zidni Ilma oh my lord increase me in knowledge he actually practically demonstrated that for us and we must continue to uplift ourselves by learning new skills attaining the knowledge and it is um, our tradition of knowledge that we continue to inquire to analyze to contemplate and start expanding what we you know uh, what we read our literature the questionings that we have for certain things and exercise critical thinking so we must so sort of like not, not 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 have a closed mind not think i've learned everything by the time i was 20 25 i don't need to do any more learning because learning is something that we have to do throughout our lives and our quest for knowledge should ultimately lead us to be more humble as well we shouldn't sort of like think well i'm you know really impressed with myself because i have a lot of knowledge no once we have knowledge we should also have humility as well we should also humble ourselves and the reality is that when a person attains more knowledge he actually realizes how little he knows because when we don't know anything we think we know everything but when you start learning and you have more knowledge then you realize that i really still don't know anything i still need to be um, learning and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that Allah raises those who believe and have knowledge in um, uh, in degrees as in in messengers and the angels lower their wings on the seekers of knowledge being pleased with what he does the inhabitants of the heavens and the earth and even the fish in the depths of the ocean seeks forgiveness for the person who seeks knowledge 
So seeking knowledge is also to be sought in stages and not all in one go. So we might, you know, you can't learn anything in one go. It has to take time. It has to be in stages. And the um, path of uh, uh, paradise is eased for the person who actually seeks knowledge. So the act of seeking knowledge through proper means is a, in itself is a virtue and it entails many rewards for the seeker. So in other words, that one does not have to be an accomplished scholar or attain its reward by, uh, by the sincere effort to uh, learn. He just has to learn what is in his capacity. So we, we learn as we go along. If we, we're slow learners, then we learn little at a time. If we're fast learners, then we learn more. And if we can, you know, certain people will live at places where there's things going on and, you know, knowledge circles taking place, then we should join in with those uh, knowledge circles. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever takes a path in search of knowledge, Allah will cause him to walk in one of the paths of paradise. Indeed, the, indeed, the angels will lower their wings in great pleasure with the one who seeks knowledge. So their ranks are raised in, in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the top rewarding uh, the virtuous act of seeking knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also acknowledges the bearers of knowledge. Those who have attained it are praised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran with their ranks being raised. So their ranks are being um, are raised up high. So they will be raised up in, uh, uh, in, their, in their ranks. So it is important to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who raises and, decrease, uh, and decreases the ranks of people. It is not allowed for us to look up or down at people. Uh, um, looking up at people, of course, but not for us to look down at people to think they don't know anything. Because it might be that they, they know more than us, but they just cannot emphasize or they cannot put it in, uh, put it in words. So we are grateful for Allah's blessings upon us. Truly, Allah is all-knowing. Allah wishes good for a person. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes good for a person, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives that person knowledge. So although knowledge is attainable, we mustn't delude ourselves in thinking that we are masters of our own fate. So we have to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because knowledge is also a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And those who are sincere in, uh, in their pursuit, then the, in the hadith, the Prophet wasallam mentions of, um, uh, to us how knowledge is given to persons whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intends good for. So if Allah intends goodness for a person, he gives him the understanding of the religion. So, and this opens the door of other virtues as well. So the merit of knowledge is that it will lead to other virtues. What sort of other virtues will it lead to? Such as fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can't comprehend how we need to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or how we should be in awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more we learn, the more knowledge we have, the more humble and virtuous we become, then the rewards will come. Then it will, um, the rewards of our seeking knowledge will uh, come as well. And in... It is those of his servants who have knowledge who stand in true awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what is in Surah Fatih to say that those people who have actually knowledge, then they are the one who will know how to have this fear, know how to have this hope. And it's in important, besides the reward, besides all the others, it is important for us to equip ourselves with the knowledge because knowledge is the prerequisite to our acts of worship as well. So if we do not know how to do something, we know we will learn how to do something if we seek the knowledge. Al, uh, Imam Al-Ghazali in his book Minhaj Al-Abidin tells us that in order for us to perform our acts of worship and be safe from error, we must first know God before worshipping him. And how can we worship him without knowing him? His divine names, his qualities, his essence. And then he continues saying that we must know what is necessary to perform the religious duties and to know that which requires us to abstain and what is prohibited. So when we are to pray, then we all know we have to pray, um, pray our salah. But we also need to know that we have to do our wudu as well. If your wudu is not uh, valid, then your prayer is not valid. So the knowledge of wudu and the knowledge of prayer is essential. So the knowledge, uh, uh, the, the knowledge for these two things is essential as well. 
Um, then other things as well, when somebody passes away, what do you do? We need to learn what do we do um, when somebody passes away. Um, uh, other things like um, cutting your nails, cutting your hair that is um, unwanted. Um, all sorts of things like that, that you need to have the knowledge. Because if you don't have the knowledge, then a lot of other things are affected as well. The same command of knowledge applies to the inner acts of worship, or worship that revolve around the matters of the heart. These are such things as tawakko, as patience, as uh, repentance, sincerity. And then we must know to abstain from the opposite, to, you know, opposite traits like um, anger, excessive anger, arrogance, you know, excessive talking and so on. So we must know what to do and what not to do. And only knowledge can tell you that. Only knowledge will be able to point that out for you. So knowledge is also compulsory for all Muslims because I know people think that uh, knowledge basically is um, just learning at schools and universities. But knowledge is compulsory as in for all our day-to-day -day affairs as well. In the, um, uh, one of the um, hadiths that the Prophet Sallallahu he mentions that seeking knowledge is a duty upon every Muslim man and woman. So not that the men know everything so we don't need to know or the woman knows everything we don't need to know. Every person, man, woman, son, daughter, we all need to have our, our knowledge intact. And so from this um, hadith that we can quite um, so like safely conclude that seeking knowledge is compulsory for all Muslims, for every Muslim. Our life is a learning, is, um, a, a learning journey. Indeed, it is impossible for, um, in, to learn all knowledge. And what is necessary to prioritize and learn our religious, religious knowledge? Um, of course, you know, we need some worldly knowledge as well, not to say that only religious knowledge, but religious knowledge is very, very important and we mustn't abandon it. Because you often find people that they will go for the worldly knowledge, they will send their children to university, they will do all sorts of things, but the religious knowledge, it's, it's very little. Um, not everyone is going to be given the same capacity or the same um, opportunity to learn. But we should make a sincere effort and we should seek um, um, that we, we, we should make a sincere effort and we should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us and to sort of like um, rid us of our shortcomings. Um, also, if, if you notice that um, in this story, we had the young man, Yusha bin Nun, who accompanied um, Moses, peace be upon him. So just to show that good companionship is very important as well. So when you are in your um, journey of learning, then try to get a friend who will actually join, join you in the activity as well. And there are du'as of uh, knowledge as well, which we, you can utilize. And one of them is the du'a that we just mentioned a little earlier, Rabbi Zidni Ilma, or my Lord, increase me in knowledge. Very important du'a, and we should try and um, uh, recite that du'a every time we are going to learn anything at all, whether it's very small, whether it's, you know, um, or as soon as we open the Quran, as soon as we open any um, uh, any book that we are going to read, Rabbi Zidni Ilma. And then the dua that, oh Allah, bring us benefit by what you taught us and teach us that which will bring us benefit and increase our knowledge. Because we want knowledge which will benefit us. So whatever we already know, whatever Allah has already taught us, we want that to benefit us. And what we are going to learn further, we want that to benefit us as well. And Allah increases us in our knowledge. And then the uh, the uh, other dua, the, oh Allah, Allah, I ask you to grant us beneficial knowledge, good and pure, permissible sustenance and deeds which are acceptable to you. So um, good knowledge, which is pure, and sustenance which are permissible and deeds which are acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we have the other du'as as well that say, Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from knowledge which does not benefit. So a heart which does not humble itself and uh, a supplication which is, not, uh, which is not answered. So lots of different du'as for your, um, to actually put to practice about learning making sure that you know what you're learning is good 
making sure that what you're learning stays with you or making sure that what you're learning is of benefit to you because if you're learning things we often find this that we learn something and the next week we, we, it's all gone from our head we can't remember anything so knowledge is a very very um a big part of islam we should always be doing something to actually go ahead and learn uh, learn things the fourth story that we learned was the story of Dhulkarnain and Dhulkarnain was um uh, the people asked Dhulkarnain to help uh, uh, to help them he did not just go and help them rather he taught them in uh, in building and helping themselves as well so it's not that you know uh, uh, can you do this for us and you just go ahead and do do it but you must also try and teach that person the skill as well just get in rather than just giving them what they want he taught them a skill they asked him to do something and he said no i will teach you uh, how to do it so they could actually master uh, the, the learning themselves and we all know the uh, saying that um, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime so he taught them how to um, uh, how, how to do this and Dulkar Nain is the um, stark contrast to the man of the two gardens so he was totally the opposite and regardless of the fact that he was very victorious and he was uh, cons constantly winning new grounds for his empire he never forgot Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he was just in his dealings he remembered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he remembered Allah in all his affairs and that is something that we should do we should remember Allah in all our affairs in all our efforts and he kept going on he kept doing good deeds wherever he would go he would go to the east he would go to the west but wherever he was he would be teaching people things he would be doing good for these people and every you know he would take a path every time and he he was established somewhere then he would move to the next place he would not rest and this teaches us as well that you know once we just think that once we're we're done we're done that's it we can rest now but there's much more that we could be doing there's so much more that we need to be um uh, accomplishing and one of the things that the story mentioned was the uh, the people of Yajuj and Majuj. It didn't say a lot about the Yajuj and Majuj, but I think it's quite nice to actually mention their story. And the Yajuj and Majuj are two tribes of people from the land of the Turks. Um, they're not dinosaurs, they're not monsters, they are just like us, they're humans. They are the children of Adam, but they are very monstrous in nature. They love destroying things they love destroying crops they love destroying trees buildings and they basically were people that were really causing a lot of fitna and fasad and they can drink up a lake they can drink the water in a lake and they are not from the people of the future they're not you know a, a mystery they are alive and kicking on this earth right now this day why can't we see them why are they not causing the facade and the fitna because of the wall that Durkarnain built. They, they can't come to our cities, they can't destroy anything at the moment because of that wall. So that wall being mentioned at that time is bringing us benefit even now. And when Yuj and Majuj come out, there'll be no need for nuclear or, you know, weapons or anything like that. They are going to be um, destroying people left, right and centre. And um, Durkar Nain uh, mentions that these are people, the, sorry this is uh, mentioned in, in the Tafsir, that um, Juj and Majur, they kept causing uh, destruction in the land. So these people, the other people that uh, asked Durkar Nain to build um, a wall, they, they said to Durkar Nain that uh, could you please build us a barrier, we will pay you. And Durkar Nain said that I, I don't need your money, Allah has given me enough money but what I want you to do is help me with the manpower. So they blocked the way, they built a wall, Sand Yuj and Majuj cannot come out of that wall. But the barrier will be broken and will be dam damaged at some stage and they will come out. The Prophet Sallallahu awoke up from sleep with a flushed red face and said, La ilaha illallah. He repeated it three times. Woe to the Arab, Arabs from the evil drawn near. Today a gap has been made in the wall of Yajuj and Majuj like this. And he formed, you know, his fingers like this. So he's saying that a, wall, um, a gap has been made. The Prophet wasallam told us how they will manage to break the wall or how they will manage to break through. They tried knocking, they tried knocking down this wall 
every single day. So even today, as we speak, they are trying to knock this wall down. They try and, you know, they penetrate it and their leader, just as they, they may be able to break through, says, right, okay, go back and we'll come back and do it tomorrow. So they think they've done quite a bit. They've broken the wall as far as they can. Tomorrow they're going to come and this wall is going to be broken and they're going to come into the land and call, cause mischief. But Allah makes it return to its normal state. So the wall becomes the wall it was before. So they go away and they come back and they have to start all over again. So every day is a new beginning and every day the wall becomes the wall that it was the first time. So Allah ordains to send them upon the people until Allah ordains to send them on the people and their leaders say, go back. So sorry, let's start again. So they go back and then they come back the next day. And then they go back again until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow it. So then this one day they will come, they will penetrate the wall and they will say, the leader will say, let's go back. We will come back tomorrow, inshallah, and we will penetrate the wall. And during this, when they come back, they will actually penetrate the wall and they will come out. And they will come out like like no one's business there'll be so many of them around and they'll be just jumping running around they will uh, dig through the dam until they could uh, they dig through the dam until they see the suns and the the leader would say go back and we will finish it tomorrow so this is just all like going back a little bit of the story so the appointed term will come to pass and they will actually come out and they will they will um start drinking the water every lake every river every pond they will uh, go past they will drink every drop every sip of water in there the people will resort to strong uh, strongholds they will run to the mountains and so on gog and magog will throw their arrows towards the sky and these arrows will come back stained with what looks like blood and they will say we have defeated the people on the earth and those in the heavens as well then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send against them a disease in the neck and in another narration it says worms in the neck and they will kill them Allah subhanahu wa uh, Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said by him in whose hands Muhammad's soul rests living creatures of the earth would go so fat and be thankful due to eating their flesh and drinking their blood so the creatures that will drink their blood and eat their flesh they'll be so uh, thankful and the coming of Juj and Majuj um, will be a major sign of the coming of the hour. So it will be very close to, to Qiyamah. And the other um, 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 thing mentioned is how Prophet Isa, peace be upon him, will kill the Dajjal. And Allah will inform Isa of the coming of um, Yajuj and Majuj. And in order for, for him to seek refuge in a mountain along with the believers. As Juj and Majuj will swarm in the land and keep causing destruction down the mountain, the believers will find it hard and harder and harder to find food and water to survive. So the Prophet ﷺ also reported to have said that Yajuj and Majuj are sons of Adam, so they are human beings. If they were allowed to come out, they would cause mischief and ruin people's lives and not one of them would die before leaving behind 1,000 or more of his offsprings. So they're going to breed like no one's business. So then uh, their destruction and ultimate abode, Isa, peace be upon him, will make dua to Allah to destroy them. And Allah will send insects which will attach themselves on their necks and they will die. The ultimate abode is undoubtedly the hellfire, given how they behaved on this dunya. So given how they, were, they behaved, their ultimate abode is the hellfire. So that was the um, four stories that we mentioned. And then there's other miscellaneous stuff that we um, uh, read in the surah as well. But I thought the stories were absolutely amazing and they really needed to be um, spoken about in, in more details, things that we missed out, things like Juj and Majuj. We also learned that the wealth and children are pleasures of this dunya. And what really matters is your good deeds, which will last and which will outlive you. So your good deeds are are what really matters your wealth and your children can contribute to all these good deeds they can become part of these good deeds but if they're not becoming part of these good deeds then they you, you know they are um, just pleasures of this dunya 
So they have they, they have a role which can be, you know, um, made much bigger. But if they're not, then they are literally just the pleasures of this dunya. And what matters is the the good deeds. And then the deed, um, the book of deeds, which will have everything in it. People, it will be given to the uh, to them. And in the very first story of uh, the story of uh, Musa al Islam, we learned that the father of those children was a righteous person. So, if you are righteous, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will look after your children as well. We seem to think that what we need to do is we need to earn money and we need to buy our children this and make sure that they've got this stability, that stability before we die. If you're a righteous person, Allah will look after your children regardless. Um, we will stop right here. Um, let's see if we've got any questions and answers. Sisters, you can unmute yourself and let's say goodbye to our Facebook friends and see 